Thank you very much. And thank you for inviting me and, and for coming to my talk after lunch when it is a beautiful day outside. So yes, as, as promised by the title, this, this is about random number generation failures throughout history. So I'm going to go back multiple decades ago and sort of survey a bunch of random number generation failures until sort of the modern era. So the context here, I think we all know this, but just to sort of make sure that we're all on the same page, um, I'm mostly going to be worrying about cryptographic communication protocols. Uh, so you, in your head, you can think something like TLS or SSH or IPsec or whatever. So the cartoon version of this to keep in your head for some portions of the talk is, you know, you have Alice and Bob, they want to communicate secretly. They do that, they do some, you know, they, they encrypt their messages using some symmetric cipher. How do they share their key using some Diffie-Hellman key exchange? And then uh, how do they authenticate? Maybe there's some signatures involved and this is sort of vulnerable to replay attacks. So then they add some random nonces and now we have something that looks kind of like a cryptographic protocol, this is totally insecure, don't do this. Um, but for the purposes of our talk, what we care about is that everything in red here requires secure cryptographically strong uh, random numbers and what happens when that fails. So, okay, we're probably mostly computer scientists in this room, so we have to go back to von Neumann and say, well, what, do, what are computers doing? Arithmetical methods of producing random digits. So. Uh, we are all in a state of sin, according to von Neumann. So, okay, if you open up your copy of Katz and Lindell Introduction to Cryptography and you ask, how do I construct a good algorithm for generate, you know, a good arithmetic algorithm for generating random digits, uh, it will tell you something like this. Uh, here's the definition of a pseudorandom generator that I just copied straight out of the textbook. Uh, so it's a polynomial time deterministic function mapping n bit strings into larger strings uh, that's computationally indistinguishable from uniform. Okay, so the picture that what we hope our computers are doing is somehow taking environmental entropy, running it through some magic algorithm that will expand it into some larger amount of entropy and we use that to generate our 4096 bit RSA keys or whatever we're doing. Well, this is a little bit oversimplified. So for example, environmental entropy is not uniformly distributed. You have to do something. Uh, well, if in theory you can add something like an extractor in, in front of this and you hope that um, if you have some amount of entropy, your extractor will sort of give you a compressed string that's pretty close to uniform and you can use that to seed your pseudorandom generator and then generate your keys. Okay, so you could keep doing this and if you keep doing this for long enough, you end up with a diagram that looks something like this. So I copied this out of NIST SP890A, the um, US NIST standard for random number generation using deterministic <laughs> random bit generators. So uh, it's got this functional model, but it looks kind of like what we had before. So we've got our generator function, which we hope is like a good pseudorandom generator maybe. Um, we've got some entropy inputs. They get run through some kind of seeding thing. We have this state, which we hope is, I don't know, the extracted entropy from all of the inputs here, and the state is used to seed our, our pseudorandom generator. So it's basically the same picture as we had before, just with a lot of other gunk going on down here. Okay, this has been taken care of. This is, the standard is, you know, 15 years old. We should be solid, right? Well, okay, so there's a bunch of practical considerations, and this is what my talk is actually about. So what do you do in practice in implementing this kind of thing? Well, there's a problem. What happens if your inputs aren't random? random? The sort of obvious answer is you could, I don't know, test for randomness. This is what most implementations try to do in some sense. There's a problem with that, which is that testing for randomness is theoretically impossible. If you believe that cryptography exists, then there exist functions whose outputs are computationally indistinguishable from random. So now we're in trouble. Uh, so I don't know, wave your hands and do as well <laughs> as you can. You know. um, uh, try to detect really bad things, I don't know. Okay, you might worry about your attacker controlling some of your inputs. What do you do? Well, I don't know, hope your attacker doesn't control all of your inputs. Seed from a variety of things, hope you do well enough. Okay, uh, how often do you reseed? This is a practical question. You can debate about this for days. There's lots of possible answers. 
Most of these are probably fine. You could reseed on every new input. You could try to collect a bunch of inputs into kind of a pool of extracted entropy so that your attacker isn't like carefully tracking the small amount of entropy in every output or something like that. And then like only reseed once you've agglomerated a bunch of them together. You could reseed after L blocks of outputs. Basically, implementations do all of these things. Okay. Here's another page of problems. Uh, sort of practical considerations with random number generators that just don't make sense in theory at all. Uh, so for example, what happens when your user doesn't seed your pseudo-random number generator? This, this doesn't exist in theory. Of course there's a seed. I mean, the solution is obvious. You seed your, your <laughs> pseudo-random number generator. Um, what happens if your user requests output before seeding the pseudo-random number generator? There's a variety of answers. You could not provide output, you could provide output, or you could raise an error flag. All of these answers are problematic. There, there basically is no good answer here. So this is, this is where we start to have a divergence between what the users of our random number generation functions who are developers, they want to have our random number generation function act like any other function where you press a button, you get an output. But in fact, randomness is an environmental resource that may or may not be present at any point in time. So this is kind of where we get a divergence. There's another problem. Perhaps you seeded your random number generator with low entropy inputs. The solution, don't do that, <laughs> right? I mean, <laughs> there, there really isn't any other better answer here. Um, or, you know, what if your user is using some flawed or backdoor design? The only answer to that is don't do that. But this is, again, difficult in practice, right? So basically, this slide here is the summary of, of what I'm going to talk about in this talk. OK, so I'm going to basically show how these problems sort of recur over and over and over again throughout history. So disaster number one that I'll talk about is the Debian OpenSSL disaster. That was discovered in 2008. And of course, the problem is your user might not seed the pseudorandom number generator. And the solution is pretty obvious. You should be seeding it. So the sort of cartoon picture that I have here, um, this is what the OpenSSL uh, random number generator looked like um, in 2008. It still basically looks like this. So it's got a mixing function, SHA-1. Um, it takes a bunch of inputs. It seeds, say, from the operating system random number generator. It also incorporates the time, the process ID. And then it just so happens that the formatting of the inputs matters. And so these are like sort of inputs to the random number generation, the, the actual architecture of the machine that you're running on. OK, so this is our cartoon picture of the OpenSSL random number generator. Here's the actual code from, this is from 2006 to 2008 of what the OpenSSL random number generator looks like. And you can see that these are all of the like SHA digest update functions. Like um, it's sort of updating the state of the hash. And then we've got like a finalized thing here. OK, how many of you have looked at this piece of code before? <laughs> One person in the whole room? Two. Two people. Oh, man, this is like a formative experience. It's like diving into OpenSSL and trying to figure out what it's doing. Um, <laughs> Anyway, so, okay, you can see this. Okay, so there's, um, I just want to bring your attention to, like, all these MD, MD update things. Okay, so, so it's doing something with SHA, it's updating the state of the uh, hash, whatever. Okay, one of these lines is much more important than the others. Do you know which one it is? What was it, the else there? Something, something. Okay. So this is an email that was sent from the maintainer of the Debian distribution of OpenSSL to the OpenSSL developer um, mailing list, um, asking like, hey, I was trying to um, you know, run Valgrind on it, and it's throwing an error. Uh, it's throwing a couple errors. It doesn't like these two lines of code. Um, and I really care about memory safety, so I'm thinking about commenting out these two lines of code. It's complaining, it's complaining about like uninitialized buffers, but really like how much entropy could an uninitialized buffer really contain, so is it a problem if I comment these out? And there were like a handful of responses that were like, I don't know, basically. Um, so uh, he did. And the result was actually that this line happened to be not in the function that was extracting entropy from 
the uh, RNG that was sort of adding in the um, uninitialized buffer to get some extra entropy. It was in the function that was adding entropy to the random number generator, which is this function, and it's this line here. And that was the line that was actually adding the inputs to the random number generator state. So in doing that, um, he commented out the one line that was actually incorporating entropy into the random number generator, and the result was that the only sources for uh, generating um, keys from OpenSSL for two years was the process ID, and then there was some difference if you, depending on your architecture again. And estimates were, people were less good at scanning the entire internet at the time, but the estimates were that at least 1% of all HTTPS hosts on the internet were actually affected by this at the time that it was disclosed. So it took two years for someone to notice that, in fact, like many hosts were generating the same keys, same cryptographic keys. Okay, so this is incredible. You would think that you'd learn, like this, this is a big disaster at the time, you'd think people would learn their lesson. Well, uh, sort of a, a series of papers, um, some of which I was involved in, um, uncovered a similar issue with Linux, essentially, um, which is that what happens if a user requests output before actually seeding the random number generator? So um, the cartoon picture of the Linux random number generator that we have here is it has a variety of inputs, uh, including the time of boot, the, some kind of version string about like um, what, you know, what version of what kind of device you're running, um, things like keyboard timings, mouse movements, hard disk timings, and device interrupts. And these are all sort of fed in at various points by the kernel, and there's also, you know, applications can also call to add entropy if they want. And Linux actually offers sort of two interfaces. Um, they, there's dev random, which is supposed to be high quality pseudo randomness. It will carefully count, give some sort of count of how much entropy it thinks you're adding at any point in time. And it, if you try to request more entropy that's been, than has been sort of officially added according to the count, it will block until it gets enough. And this is supposed to guarantee some kind of high quality. Um, then there's dev u random, which only promises pseudo randomness and it never blocks. Okay, and the man page for random says, as a general rule, dev u random should be used for everything except long lived GPG, SSL, and SSH keys. Which one do you think everybody used for their long lived GPG, uh, SSL, and SSH keys? Right. But this is, this should be fine because as long as you have a reasonable mixing function, which, uh, you know, the, the, Mixing function that Linux was using in 2012 was not great. I think they've updated it since, uh, but it's still like not really cr that broken. Okay, um, but there's a lot of strange things that people believe about random number generators. So I have like <laughs> taken some random quotes of random people that I found on the internet about dev random and, and dev u random. Things like dev u random can run out of entropy if it's called repeatedly, um, or uh, dev random is information theoretically random. Uh, and this is a comment in the source code of Dropbear, which is a um, SSH server, which is used, it's common on, uh, it's sort of lightweight, so it's common on embedded devices. Um, we'll use dev u random by default since dev random is too much hassle. If system develop developers aren't keeping seeds between boots nor getting any entropy from somewhere, it's their own fault. Okay? You can guess what the system developers were actually doing. I mean, so, yeah, kind of these strange beliefs that developers have and kind of like tossing the buck on like what, what is actually, you know, whose responsibility is it to seed the random number generator? Um, okay. So there's a looming disaster here. So I've mentioned basically um, we're gonna focus on low resource devices. So think about your Wi-Fi router um, or think about your Wi-Fi router in 2012 or 2001. Um, so this, it's a fine little Wi-Fi router, but it doesn't actually have a lot of the inputs that Linux was assuming were present um, as entropy sources. So it might not have a real-time clock, so the boot time might just be, you know, January 1st, 1970. Um, it doesn't have a keyboard, it doesn't have a mouse, it doesn't have a hard disk, and actually uh, at some point, um, Device interrupts have been included and not included at various versions of the Linux kernel, 
and they, they had been turned off a couple years prior to 2012 because it was causing pro it was causing extra overhead for high performance like servers that had to process like many many network connections at once. It's a lot of overhead to add entropy like on every single connection. So um, they'd actually remove device interrupts from uh, an entropy source. So this meant that on this kind of little device, the actual the only source of entropy that was being added to the Linux kernel was the version string, some, some timings eventually, and then occasionally some other you know, application would add some entropy. So we have a looming disaster here. There's a second issue, which is that um, because of sort of this threat model of worrying about attackers who could like track like low entropy inputs, um, the design, what, what the Linux random number generator does is it has an input pool and it tries to collect a large number of inputs with a, a large amount of entropy and add it all at once into the output pool before allowing the, a user to extract randomness. So then um, this is to make sure that you know, your adversary can't sort of like query the, the PRNG, uh, brute force like eight bits of entropy that were added, query it again, brute force another eight bits that were added, sort of track the state. But what this meant in practice for these little kind of low resource devices is this is sort of a simulation that we did, but it's not unreasonable. Um, it meant that even though there was entropy being mixed into the state of, um, into the random number generator, it wasn't actually mixed into the output pool, and so it didn't actually show up in the output until well after boot. And because a lot of uh, applications automatically boot sort of the first time you start up your device and do things like generate cryptographic keys, that meant that the random number generator hadn't been seeded yet at the point when the device booted and uh, started extracting outputs from the pseudo-random number generator in order to generate their keys. So this is a picture of, this is a, basically a, a general purpose computer with um, almost all the inputs turned off. So um, the SSH process started, say, four seconds after boot, and um, the entropy wasn't actually mixed into the output pool for the Linux random number generator until more than a, a minute after boot. So that meant that he, at this point, the output of the Linux random number generator was basically deterministic. Yeah. Um, so this has been patched since July 2012. Um, they did a bunch of things, including uh, mixing in MAC addresses, being more liberal in mixing in uh, device interrupts, and being a lot more liberal in mixing in entropy, like uh, right on first boot, until, um, until the, the PRNG had actually been seeded. Um, there's also an improved interface um, that's sort of c what you want correctly from a cryptographic point of view. It blocks if it hasn't been seeded, and it always provides output if it has been seeded. So these usability problems has been, have been fixed in some sense. Okay, so what is the effect that this actually has on cryptography? So the picture of the cascade that we have here is that um, we have you know, the operating system random number generator um, that takes a bunch of inputs, but on sort of low resource devices, these inputs might be missing, and so this might be deterministic when it's queried by an application like OpenSSL, which then takes a bunch of uh, inputs that may also be roughly deterministic on the same types of devices. Um, and this pseudorandom number generator is then used to generate cryptographic keys. So our, the, what this disaster looked like in 2012 is that we were able to compute the private keys for about half a percent of all HTTPS hosts, about 1% of SSH hosts, and uh, there was a team run by Arian Leinster here um, that was able to do, they did HTTPS and they also computed the private keys for two PGP users. Um, so what has happened since? It turns out that this kind of disaster keeps reoccurring. So um, there's been a number of sort of large scale studies of different random number generation issues. Um, these were all found in black box ways, so they're not all due to Linux and OpenSSL, but many of them are. So, uh, with my students, we actually did a follow-up study asking, so we reported these vulnerabilities to all the manufacturers that we could find in 2012, to the Linux kernel, uh, patches were distributed, um, security advisories were published, did people actually fix anything? And since 2012, there's been sort of a growing industry of internet-wide scanning which makes doing measurements of this kind uh, quite easy. And so we actually took a, a number of like 
full internet scans of the HTTPS ecosystem and asked, did people actually fix these problems? Um, and so this is the number of, the total number of HTTPS hosts that we had. There, you can see a little bit of artifacts from like different scanning methodology. So ignore those. Um, and this is the number of keys, the number of private keys that we were able to compute, or the number of hosts with private keys that we were able to compute. So the point at which we disclose the vulnerabilities is about here. You can see that the number of vulnerable hosts actually continue to rise. So there does not immediately be, seem to be any evidence of patching. It's hard to tell what's going on here. The number of vulnerable hosts still seems to be rising, although it's dropped some. It makes a lot more sense if you sort of break these out using metadata and look at individual vendors who are vulnerable. So um, Juniper, they have these um, network security boxes that were vulnerable. Uh, they were the majority of factored keys in 2012 um, that we were able to compute. And if you look at the plot, okay, so this is the total number of hosts that have metadata that we can identify as what we believe are vulnerable versions. And then this is the number of vulnerable keys. This is not dropping, even though they claim they release security advisories and patches at this, in this window here. Um, it does have a huge drop during Heartbleed. So clearly sort of Heartbleed had much more of an effect than anything that we did. I guess the lesson is have, have a logo. But of course, all the people who are worried about Heartbleed, uh, they were worried about their private keys being computed um, by an attacker who was making, say, thousands of queries to an individual, like, you know, an individual host in a targeted attack. We already had all these people's private keys and they didn't notice or care. So, another picture that's a little bit sadder. So, um, Huawei. Uh, uh, introduced a vulnerable product uh, sometime in 2014, so they weren't even present in our original study. Um, sometime in 2014, they introduced uh, a new product and um, keys that we were able to compute started appearing in 2014. Um, we notified them, they published a security advisory, uh, but this sort of illustrates that it's very hard to eradicate these kinds of vulnerabilities. Even though you know, we published the papers that we could make, there were security advisories, we talked to CERT, everything that you could do, um, this same vulnerability was reoccurring in new, um, in new products. And this is not for any kind of interesting reason. I mean, a lot of these products are just using old versions of the Linux kernel, and so they will contain the same old bugs. So, okay, moving on to the next disaster. We'll go back into prehistory, which may predate some people in the room, but probably not many of us, um, <laughs> all the way back to 1996 and sort of the, I think one of the first random number generator disasters that got a lot of attention, which was the Netscape SSL RNG. So Netscape, uh, back in the dark ages of the web, when they in, sort of implemented SSL, it's gonna be SSL v2, uh, or v3, v2? I don't remember. Um, so their, like, their first SSL implementation, um, in order to generate the secret keys uh, on um, the client, they were seeding with the following values, the clock time, and the process ID, and the parent process ID. And then they were running it through, I mean, they're generating a seed by hashing these things, and then they have an RNG that's like using MD5 repeatedly hashing it to provide outputs. So this is a problem because these items together, if you know approximately what time a connection was initiated, have maybe 40 bits of entropy, which even in 1996 was quite easy for someone to brute force. So um, Goldberg and Wagner discovered this uh, as grad students um, and this made a lot of noise and people, people learned, you know, clock time is not a good source of, of randomness, right? You would hope that people learned this. Well, okay, um, so a slightly more sophisticated version of this um, I'll talk about is the duck attack, which is don't use hard-coded keys. Um, so this is a paper that I did with my grad student, Shannon um, and Matt Green. Uh, and there's kind of two flaws here. One of them is the same flaw, the random number generator being seeded with low entropy inputs. And 
then a second problem, which is um, a sort of random number generator design that has an underlying flaw. Okay. The answers to sort of both of these are obvious, right? Like seed with high entropy inputs, don't use vulnerable designs. Oh well. Okay. So the ANSI X931 random number generator, uh, I'll explain the history in a second. So the design is based off of a block cipher and it uses the time as entropy. But it, it re repeatedly incorporates the time, so it's not like trivially broken. So at each input, um, you have the previous state and then you have a current timestamp. And you take the previous state, you run the timestamp through your block cipher, and then, I don't know, you, you have some XORs, you run it through block cipher again, blah, blah, blah. You get um, a block of output, and then you get, you run, you know, you do some more XORing and block ciphering, and then you get a block of, uh, you get a new state. So this thing sort of ticks forward um, at discrete iterations. At every uh, iteration, you get a block of output and a new state, and the input on each iteration is the current timestamp. And it's based off of a block cipher. I wrote AES here because that's the version we care about, but you could use any block cipher you want here. Okay, so this random number generator has a long history. It was one of the first sort of widely standardized designs. So um, it was first published as far as we know in 1985. There was a version that was based off of the DES block cipher uh, that was standardized in ANSI X917, which was a standard for cryptography for the financial industry back when public key cryptography wasn't even feasible and DES was the state of the art. So it's not totally an unreasonable design for 1985. Uh, this design was then sort of adopted by the US government um, as a FIP standard. It was included on the list of approved random number generators for US government purposes uh, starting in the early 90s and continuing until today. And as the sort of favored block cipher uh, changed, uh, variants of this design using improved block ciphers kept being published. So there was a version using triple DES uh, that was standardized in, um, I think this is an RSA standard actually. Um, in 1998, there was a vulnerability pointed out, which I will explain uh, shortly. Um, despite this sort of paper that was published uh, pointing out this vulnerability, um, this random number generator design was included in um, further versions of uh, FIP standards uh, in the early 2000s. Uh, NIST published a version of this algorithm which was based off of AES in 2005 and it was included on a list of approved random number generators for uh, FIP certification. So federal government use. Um, it wasn't deprecated, despite the fact that um, the um, NIST SP890A um, standard that I, I showed on the, um, in an early slide was published um, in this window here. Uh, this, this particular design, which was not included on this list because it was, you know, uh, it's, it's not particularly secure. It wasn't actually deprecated until 2011, and it wasn't completely removed from the list of approved random number generators until 2016. So this design had a long history, and there were a number of, um, well, we certainly know that there's a large number of, of uh, approved, pro like products approved for US federal government use uh, in this window um, that use this design, and there were presumably a large number of products developed here that also use this design. Okay, so the flaw that was pointed out by Kelsey Schneier, Wagner, and Hall in 1998, back when cryptography was exciting, um, is they, so they, they published this paper looking at a bunch of pseudo, like sort of practical pseudorandom number generator designs that were used in practice. Um, so this is a very simple flaw. Basically, the, the underlying problem is that this is a block cipher, so it's got an inversion function, right? If you know the key, you have a decryption operation. So if the key is known to an attacker, they can brute force some timestamps and actually do state recovery. So the way this works, well, you, an attacker can see, um, say, a block of output. Um, then they just run this thing backwards, do decryption, and then 
um, they brute force a timestamp, and this gives a guess for the state. If you do this twice, then you get, um, then you can compare the the output that you would have gotten on the previous guess. So you brute force two times timestamps, and you compare two blocks of output. If they collide, then you had then you actually carried out state recovery. So brute forcing two timestamps um, and knowing this key k is enough to basically uniquely identify the state. This is, this is a problem. This seems like it should have been enough to sort of discount this random number generator, but I, you know, I don't know. I guess as long as this key k is not known, then this is fine, right? You can't do this. So, okay. What did the NIST uh, description of this algorithm for AES look like? What did it say about this key K, which is sort of vital to this being a secure pseudorandom number generator design? Um, what they said about this key K is for AES 128 bit key, let star K be 128 bit key. And this star K is reserved only for the generation of pseudorandom numbers. They did not say, please don't hard code this key. They did not say this key should be generated in a cryptographically secure manner. You can guess what happened. So um, the great thing about having grad students is that they can do painful things <laughs> for you, like read through hundreds and hundreds of uh, FIPS certification documents, which, um, I mean, this is, this is actually great. So you know, when products are, go through the certification process, they produce this like, multi-page document that describes their processes for uh, generating key, cryptographic keys and storing these cryptographic keys, and they do this in great detail. Um, so it sort of, once we thought like maybe somebody screwed something up based off of this, uh, this property, we searched through uh, hundreds of FIPS security policies and found a small but non-zero number of uh, implementations that actually documented that they generated a hard-coded key and used it to generate their um, random outputs. So the language that the, these uh, products that we identified as vulnerable used uh, was things like the key is compi compiled into the binary, statically stored in the code, hard-coded, uh, generated external to the module, entered in the factory, things like that. So this is, you know, an, an attacker who can buy one of these devices and, you know, reverse engineer the code can certainly um, extract a hard-coded value like this. Okay. So in order to actually demonstrate this, because you always have to demonstrate your attack work, um, uh, wait, okay. Um, we uh, carried out a state recovery attack against uh, FortiGate VPNs, so FortiOS V2 was vulnerable um, to this attack. They uh, generated their keys external to the module, which meant that they were hard-coded in the source code. Um, and we actually did passive uh, IPsec uh, decryption based off of this random number generation flow. <coughs> so we reverse engineered the uh, software, extracted the key, um, and then um, wanted to actually decrypt the you know, encrypted traffic that uh, was being sent out. So in the context of IPsec, what does this actual um, sort of state recovery vulnerability look like? Well, okay. Um, if Alice and Bob, our initiator and responder of IPsec, were just doing Diffie-Hellman key exchange, um, we wouldn't get raw RNG outputs in order to carry out the state recovery attack. But we need actually the raw outputs of the algorithm in order to do the state recovery. Thankfully, there's a random nonce on both sides, which is generated generally before the Diffie-Hellman uh, secret. And so if we carry out the state recovery attack against the random nonce and then use that once we've recovered the state, then we can compute the um, Diffie-Hellman secret, then we can compute the uh, symmetric keys that are used and decrypt the, the rest of the traffic that's sent. So in this, in this sense, the protocol is actually helping us <laughs> because we get raw RNG outputs. This is a little bit counterintuitive. Um, I'm lying to you slightly. There's some... IPsec is super complicated, there's multiple versions, there's nonces and cookies of various lengths, and it happens that some, version, some versions have the correct lengths and some of them don't. It's very confusing. Okay. But basically, 
these nonces are great. This will happen again and again. Okay, so what was the uh, hard-coded value that um, was included in these FortiGate VPNs? Um, this, they're using, we're, we can attack only 40 as before. In 40 as v5, they're no longer using this random number generator design. Um, but the hard coded uh, key that they used is the NIST test vector. So um, it was uh, based on the distribution of timestamps generated by the machines. It was about 2 to 25 work to brute force. So basically, this can be done in seconds. Um, we actually uh, did internet wide scans and were able to recover the private keys for our traffic with random hosts that we, were, we connected with in the, in the wild. Um, and as I said, uh, so later versions of uh, Fortios don't include the ANSI X931 random number generator at all because, of course, it was deprecated a few years ago. And uh, after we disclosed to Fortinet, they patched. So this is, you know, this is old news. So, okay. We've seen bad algorithms be used, despite the fact that they were known bad for a long time. Let's continue on with some more bad algorithms. So, um, I guess the remainder of my talk will be about multiple dual ECDRBG disasters. Okay, so um, version number one is sort of the plain dual ECDRBG DBG, D, uh, DRBG attack. Um, so, of course, this is the probably backdoored pseudorandom number generator design that was pushed by the NSA. The solution here is, of course, don't use vulnerable designs. Um, okay, so dual ECDRBG is this pseudorandom number generator design. It was, um, it is based off of, well, it's supposed to be based off of the hardness of computing discrete logs for elliptic curves. Um, and it's dual EC because it's got two elliptic curve points for some reason. So it's got some parameters, which are these pre-specified points P and Q um, that are just sort of fixed and hard-coded for a given implementation. Um, and actually, the standard that was published by NIST contains fixed um, suggested parameters. So the seed is a 32-byte integer S, which in this picture is here. This picture is a little bit confusing, but whatever. Um, so there's a seed, and then um, the state um, is the x-coordinate of s times p, um, basically. Uh, and you can update um, with optional additional input. So you can xor additional input in. We'll ignore that for a second. And basically, um, the state at that point is the x-coordinate of you know, your sort of previous seed times p. Okay, so there's this iteration function. And then in order to um, get some output, you take your current state S, you multiply it by your point Q, you take the X coordinate of that, um, and then you output, you throw away the top two most significant bytes, and you return the 30 least significant bytes. Okay. So you can basically, this algorithm ticks forward in a similar way that you can update um, the state using the current state, and then you can output, you can use the state to output uh, a block of output. So it's basically like chunk, 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 chunk. You update your state, you output a block, update your state, output a block. Okay. The reason that we care about this algorithm design is because it has a quite interesting history. In the early 2000s, the NSA designed this algorithm and, and sort of pushed uh, this algorithm towards standardization. Um, it was published as a couple of um, drafts. It was published in an ANSI uh, RNG draft. It was standardized um, in NIST SP890, so this uh, random number generator uh, draft that I keep mentioning. Um, in 2007, at the crypto rump session, uh, Dan Schumo and Niels Ferguson demonstrated that there was a theoretical backdoor in this design, that if somebody controlled the generation of the parameters, that uh, a, sta a state recovery attack was possible. Um, this was sort of forgotten, or at least did not make a lot of noise. People didn't really think about it very much until 2013, when um, some of the Snowden documents, and in fact, uh, sort of articles that were written about the Snowden documents without actually ever publishing the particular documents in question led to some renewed interest in this algorithm uh, and pointed to it as being 
evidence of the NSA's sort of influence over the standardization uh, procedure. Um, in 2014, after this renewed interest, uh, a number of academics uh, wrote a paper, which I cited, uh, giving practical attacks on TLS, pointing out that TLS is in fact completely vulnerable to passive decryption to, uh, against an adversary who has knowledge of the back door. Um, and in 2015, after an internal investigation, NIST actually removed this algorithm from the list of approved pseudorandom number generators. Okay. So what is the back door that was described by Shumo and Ferguson? Uh, so the idea here is that an attacker controls the standardization process and they construct some elliptic curve points that have some known relationship, uh, you know, P is some multiple of Q and the attacker knows this, this D multiplier and, and nobody else does. So there's some opaque points P and Q that are published as part of the standard. Now if, an, if the attacker wants to do a state recovery, they get 30 bytes of output. So this is the x-coordinate of s times q, where s is sort of the unknown state that they want to recover. Uh, they brute force the most significant bits that have been sort of chopped off in the output, um, which generates a list of candidates, uh, not too many, uh, for the possible state. And for each possible candidate state, uh, the attacker can then sort of um, tick forward the next uh, the state to the next output and compare this to the next output and um, if they were correct then they know that they got the state uh, and that they can continue on. Okay, So kind of the very quick version of this backdoor. So this relies on the attacker knowing this relationship. Uh, this is easy to compute if the attacker knows the relationship and it is infeasible if uh, you don't know the relationship because the elliptic curve discrete log problem should be hard. So why is this interesting? Well, so among the uh, sort of damning documents published in the, um, in the Snowden leaks was uh, this document describing the uh, budget priorities for the NSA bull run program in the New York Times. Uh, among the goals for that year, uh, the NSA wanted to insert vulnerabilities into commercial encryption systems, IT systems, networks, and endpoint communications devices used by targets, and influence st policies, standards, and specifications for commercial public key technologies. So this is, this is damning, but it doesn't actually describe exactly what is going on. So the big technical question is what has been influenced? Um, so in the paper from uh, Cechoe et al. in 2014, um, they published complexity estimates for actually carrying out a, um, a state recovery and decryption attack against popular TLS libraries that implemented the dual EC algorithm. Uh, so I just copy pasted this, this table out of their paper. Um, and uh, they get, you know, sort of very feasible complexity estimates, but there's kind of some problems. So among other things, the OpenSSL library implemented the dual EC algorithm, but there was a bug in their implementation, which meant that uh, it was not actually um, usable by anyone, and apparently nobody had noticed. Uh, so the authors of this paper actually had to fix this bug in order to uh, carry out the attack. Um, the only sort of library that it seems likely that uh, was sort of widely used was the RSA BSafe library, where um, there was a, a leak that sort of noted that RSA had been paid $10 million to implement this algorithm as the default in this library. So um, that is, uh, this is interesting, but in the some sense like where, this is a lot of smoke and not very much fire because how many people are really using BeSafe? Like if the NSA like really did all this work, is this the best that they could do? Is like a handful of libraries, like where, where, where's the actual interesting stuff here? Like this is not see, this does not seem like it really is leading to widespread passive decryption capabilities. So that leads me to my last disaster, which is the Juniper Dual EC incident. Um, and this is uh, joint work with a large number of co-authors. Um, and of course, the problem here is again, using a backdoor pseudo random number generator design the solution is don't use known vulnerable designs, even if you don't think that you're vulnerable to the backdoor. So this is maybe maybe a little bit of more of where the fire was. Okay, so in December of 2015, um, Juniper published a security advisory saying that there was um, uh, a couple of um, 
sort of security vulnerabilities. Um, one of them was uh, like an administrative hard-coded password, um, and the other one was a passive VPN decryption capability um, on some of their VPN products. So this sort of went out on Twitter, and then immediately like all of the random security people who were at home for Christmas break on Twitter like freaked out and started like reverse engineering everything in sight. So after some diffing of uh, patches, um, the main change that was noted was a change in a couple of elliptic curve points. So these are curves on um, P256, and there was a change in one of the um, one of the curve points. And the context of these points is that they were x coordinates for a dual EC uh, point Q. Okay, so this is this is interesting. Um, however, what's the point of this? Because Juniper actually a couple years before, during all the sort of um, kerfuffle about the dual ECDRBG algorithm, um, they actually released a public notice that said, um, we are using dual ECDRBG, but not in the default manner. And so we're not vulnerable to any backdoors. So there were two sort of facts. One of them is that uh, they use their own non-default points, P and Q, for this algorithm. and um, Nobody had noticed that they were even implementing this algorithm because they were FIPS validated for ANSI X931, the ANSI X931 algorithm, and not for dual EC. And what they were doing was actually using dual EC in a cascade of random number generators. So they're using dual EC to seed the ANSI X931 random number generator, and then they were using ANSI X931 to actually generate their cryptographic keys. So they said, well, a state recovery attack like uh, the one that I showed you a couple slides ago is not actually feasible because the output that an attacker would get is the output of ANSI X931 and not the raw bytes that would be necessary to actually carry out the state recovery. So we're solid. We're going to keep using it. And so we're not vulnerable to any NSA backdoors. That was their, their announcement. OK. Here is uh, some pseudocode from Juniper's um, ScreenOS RNG cascade that um, is supposed to output um, uh, ANSI X931 stuff. This is due to a lot of reverse engineering by some of our co-authors, prominently Steve Checkaway, who is amazing at reverse engineering. Okay, so this is a lot of pseudocode. So sort of the picture here is that um, you have, it's going to generate some output. It's got this reseed function, and this reseed function is actually going to generate dual EC. So um, this, is, this is always true, so it's always going to reseed, and when it reseeds, it's going to generate a block of dual EC output. Okay? So now comes the interesting vulnerability. Uh, so this variable here is actually a global variable. Um, during this reseed function, this global variable is set to 32, which means that this for loop here never actually runs. Subtle vulnerability number one. And the sort of cherry on top is that this buffer here is reused. So this buffer here, when this is supposed to be run, uh, this actually contains raw dual EC output, and this section here, and uh, I mean, this is copied later into like the, um, the seed and the key for the ANSI X931 algorithm. Um, but the output of the ANSI X931 algorithm is actually reusing the same buffer. So after this for loop never runs, uh, this buffer that's supposed to contain uh, ANSI X931 output actually contains raw dual EC output. So uh, unlike Juniper's claim, their uh, RNG cascade actually contained a subtle vulnerability and did not, uh, and actually was outputting raw dual EC for the use of wh whichever attacker is playing with stuff here. Okay, at this point, the state recovery and passive decryption for uh, IPsec looks exactly like what I showed you for the uh, duck attack. So an attacker can get, um, they can look at a, a raw random nonce, which is the out raw output of dual EC, use that to carry out a state recovery attack, uh, get the um, 
Diffie-Hellman secret and then decrypt the ciphertext. Uh, so ScreenOS actually used a 32-byte nonce, which meant that the uh, attack was extremely efficient, very convenient. Uh, in IPsec, you can vary the length of the nonce as you like. Um, and then, yeah, you can recover the state and then recover the secret exponents and then decrypt the ciphertext. Okay, so where was this bug actually introduced? The sort of most interesting part of uh, this paper is not actually a demonstration of the vulnerability, but the fact that if um, through extensive reverse engineering of all of the versions of ScreenOS, um, this, this bug that exposed the raw dual EC output was not introduced by the attacker who had int introduced the unauthorized code change that changed the point. It was introduced at the time when ScreenOS actually adopted the dual EC algorithm. So prior to that change, they were using ANSI X930, uh, X931 RNG. Um, they were reseeding periodically. They had 20 byte uh, nonces. After the change, in 2008, well before uh, the backdoor, sort of the, the attacker made the modification in the code, um, they introduced this cascade. Uh, there was this bug that exposed the raw dual EC output. They reseeded every call, which is convenient. Uh, they generated the nonces before the keys, and they had 32 byte Ike nonces, which meant that the attack was quite efficient. It wouldn't really have been efficient if they were only using 20 byte nonces. So the attacker changed this constant in 2012, but the vulnerability was there since 2008. Um, and this meant that passive decryption was enabled for anybody who knew what parameters Juniper had used originally in their dual AC output. Um, Juniper's fix was to reinstate their original uh, Q value, but that meant that the, um, this relationship, um, whoever, whoever wrote this code would have been able to continue to passively decrypt values. So after our paper, they removed dual AC completely. So this is sort of my last couple of slides. Um, just some brief discussion, uh, sort of in this talk, we saw the same vulnerabilities arising over and over and over and over again. It seems like we point something out and people may or may not actually learn something from it. Um, there's some pretty serious gaps between theory and practice in random number generation in particular. Um, we should know how to model these things, but somehow there's vulnerabilities that aren't really encompassed by the models. Um, We've also seen that it's difficult to eradicate vulnerabilities from devices, even when a lot of noise is made about them, even when uh, security advisories are, are published and patches are available, people don't patch things. It's very hard to get people to patch things. Um, it's also very hard to audit this kind of code. So a lot of the papers that I described were either using black box methods where we just collected a bunch of keys and looked for stupid things happening with the keys or by extensive reverse engineering. And this does, doesn't really scale, right? You need like, it takes quite a while for somebody to learn to reverse engineer and then it takes like a year per implementation and it's just, you know, very painful. And finally, we've seen things like there's a lot of debate about uh, lawful access to encrypted data and proposals about things like, um, oh, we should, uh, we, you know, why can't you cryptographers design like cryptographically secure uh, lawful access mechanisms? And the Juniper dual EC disaster is an example of why not, um, because backdoors can be repurposed. So um, I feel obligated when I give talks about uh, breaking things to say that not everything is broken. Most things are actually fine. Um, so the other three random number generator constructions in NIST SP890A are mostly fine if they are implemented correctly and securely. So as far as we know, um, Intel uh, several years ago uh, implemented a fast, harder random number generator inter interface that provides multiple, uh, multiple calls to get like hardware outputs. Um, it, as far as we know, it's not backdoored and it's very fast. Um, and then, as I said, Linux has provided a better interface than the default uh, random number generator interfaces for um, random number generation. So that's all I have. So thank you.